The pediatric and adolescent patient with an ACL injury is a challenging pro uh, problem and challenging patient for an orthopedist. What I'm going to talk about are the treatment options and decision making that comes into play with these patients. Pediatric ACL injuries, uh, there's been an increased incidence of pediatric ACL injury, which is thought to be related to uh, the greater number that of children participating in organized sports, increased recognition, and improved methods for diagnosing these problems. When, when you're dealing with these patients, the options for treatments are, are, are pretty much fivefold, but essentially conservative or non-operative treatment versus uh, operative repair or operative reconstruction. And I'm going to speak of uh, these options today. First, conservative or non-operative treatment. That involves basically rehab, rehabilitation and bracing. The rehab is um, as it usually would be in an ACL patient, which is you know, phase one of the initial treatment of the injury and uh, decrease in swelling and getting back motion. Phase two, which involves res uh, fully restoring the rest of the motion, uh, obtaining muscle balance. And phase three, which is basically getting the patient back uh, to their activity. Um, when you talk about the natural history of non-operative treatment and instability, there are several studies over the years that have uh, addressed these problems. Um, and some of these studies have shown, um, first with McCarroll, and what you'll see with these studies is uh, the, the number of patients in these studies is a very low number. So it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, deal with these problems because of the low numbers. Uh, first study, McCarroll, shows uh, that all of the 16 patients had instability at their two and a half years. Second study, um, Angel and Hall, which uh, showed of 27 patients, a uh, majority have recurrent inst instability uh, by three or four years. And third study, Mizuda, uh, 17 out of 18 patients had instability, had an instability episode by three or four years. McCarroll study had an another study showing 38 athletes treated with bracing activity modification. Uh, all un ended up undergoing delayed ACL reconstruction. Uh, uh, half of them had attempt to return to sports and almost 100% had instability episodes. And what's very important is that uh, more than two-thirds had a symptomatic meniscal tear at the time of ACL reconstruction. When you dealing with these problems, uh, certainly when you're reconstructing an ACL, you'd like to do it before there is a meniscal problem. And uh, a Millet study in 2002 showed that in the younger patients who were treated for ACL reconstruction, with an average age of 13.6 years, there was uh, about three and a half months from time, to average three and a half months of time to surgery. Uh, Two-thirds of these patients had meniscal tears or other in, uh, intra-articular injuries. Of these injuries, 19 required an additional treatment. And I think the, the important thing here is if you look at these, uh, the numbers of what type of meniscal work was done, um, I'm sure everybody is aware that in a younger patient, you will repair the meniscus if at all possible. And that's what all the patients ask when they come in. Are you going to repair my meniscus? Whether the patient's 10 or whether the patient's 75, they're asking you to repair their meniscus. So in th this is the group of patients that you would most likely want to repair the <coughs> meniscus. And even in this group, only 50% had a meniscal repair. So while you'd like to repair the meniscus, it's not possible in, in, in the majority of the situations. And when you're looking at these uh, meniscal injuries, um, Meniscal, medium meniscal injury is more common in the chronic group than the acute group. Lateral meniscal tear is actually the same in both. And um, delaying treatment is associated with higher incidence of medial meniscal tear, which is an important um, thing to remember. Uh, Janarv's study in 96 had 22 patients, um, 15 patients surgery uh, up to two years, and it found that the patients desired and actual levels of activity were the strongest indicator for failure of conservative treatment. So essentially, if a patient wants to go back into regular activities, there's a high chance they'll have instability and a high chance they'll need surgery. <coughs> Direct repair is uh, repair of the ACL tear. I'll go over this quickly. Um, the study in um, 
1988 showed uh, eight patients with uh, direct repair, follow-up of three to eight years, all had decreased boarding activity, uh, five out of eight had unstable knees, and basically the, the, the conclusion of that is that primary pair has poor results. Uh, another study showed 13 patients, and this is out of Vail with Stedman, which is a little different in that this was a very specific type of young patient where it, Stedman essentially did a microfracture in, in the femur area, in the uh, area of the fem femoral insertion uh, in patients who had a proximal um, ACL tear. And actually, in his hands, this, the uh, 10 out of 13 actually did well. However, um, this is something that he's been more successful with, been, with than other people, and um, these are proximal tears. The mid-substance tears are uh, generally poor results. So the take-home po uh, points from uh, conservative treatment and uh, direct ACL repair are that conservative management may be successful in patients willing to decrease their activity level. The most active patients have a higher risk of failing non-op treatment. High incidence of meniscal tears are associated with chronic ACL tears, and direct repair of mid-substance tear has poor results. The, uh, the other surgical treatments are ACL reconstructions, and there are different ways of doing this. First is physosparing sparing reconstruction, which basically means you avoid going through the growth plate with your tunnels. The advantages of this type of treatment is that uh, when you go over the top, which means you go around the back of the femur rather than through the femur, you avoid going through the growth plate and it possibly or questionably could limit the risk of uh, growth plate closure. The disadvantage is that it's non-anatomic non -anatomic, and uh, because the graft is non-anatomic, there is a risk of the graft stretching over time. A few studies on this, uh, one only had six children and soft tissue grafts uh, over the front of the tibia and over the back of the femur. And this study showed uh, up to two and a half years, uh, four out of five could return to a uh, level of sports. Uh, they had no growth injuries and um, it was an effective technique in restoring ACL stability. However, MRIs did show that the, uh, the reconstructed area did not actually look normal. Uh, next type of operative treatment is a partial physal sparing reconstruction, which essentially is uh, going around the back of the femur in the over-the-top position, but going through the tibia with a, uh, a tunnel on the tibial side. And um, there are a few studies on that. Lowe in 97 had a small group of patients, average age 12.9, where they were expected to have up to uh, five centimeters of growth, uh, expected growth. He did. Uh, soft tissue grafts with small holes in the tibia and an over-the-top position on the femur. Uh, Follow-up of seven years and uh, patients were stable. They didn't have any leg length uh, issues. So that actually worked pretty well. Uh, however, it was a small series and uh, the fixation of the graft was away from the growth plate in order to avoid growth uh, abnormalities. Second study uh, by Andrews in 94, eight patients, soft tissue grafts, and the knees were a, a little bit stable, uh, I mean, a little bit unstable, a little loose, um, but a follow at follow-up of three years' time, they had no growth uh, discrepancies and uh, two-thirds had returned to sports. So obviously that's, those results aren't great and that one-third of these patients were not able to return to the sports despite what was considered a relatively successful operation by physical exam. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the last way of treating these patients is all transfisal, which means you go through the growth plate and you basically treat these patients as if you would uh, treat an uh, adult or fully develop, developed uh, patient. Uh, the advantages of this is that this is isometric uh, position of your graft and um, you can have bony healing to the epiphyseal side of the growth plate, which is what you'd like to have in, these, uh, in ACL reconstructions. The disadvantage is the potential of growth problems. A few studies on that. First study in 02 by Acroft, uh, 45 patients uh, without skeletal maturity, all underwent uh, soft tissue hamstring uh, reconstructions where the fixation of the graft was not through the growth plate. Uh, they had no growth problems. A second uh, study, Edwards, in 2001, 
uh, 20 patients, routine ACL reconstruction as you would perform in an adult. Uh, 16 had soft tissue semitendinosus and gracilis. Five had patella tendon grafts with bone. And they tried to make their tibial tunnels a little vertical to try to prevent or avoid growth disturbances. Um, and basically, three quarters of their patients did well in this type of uh, procedure. They didn't have any uh, growth disturbances. Uh, 16 of the 21 knees were actually very stable. Um, and bottom line of the 21, they had 15 excellent and two good, four poor results. So those, again, these patients, their results do not approach the results in an adult patient, but these, these results were relatively good with no growth disturbances. Their conclusions were that routine intraarticular ACL reconstructions is effective in eliminating instability, the failure rate was higher than adults, and they didn't have growth disturbances. There was a, uh, there's a study group called the Herodicus Society, an ACL study group, and they sent out a survey to their members in 2002 asking them to uh, reply on how they treat this group of patients. Um, they had about 140 people respond to the survey, and they had a few case study type things, and they said, how would you treat an 88-year-old with this type of problem? And um, almost two-thirds would treat it non-operatively uh, initially, and only uh, 15 to 16 percent would treat it operatively initially. Uh, 26 said they would try to delay it until the patient was older. Once you get up into the 13-year-old, half would treat it non-operatively initially, and uh, one-third would treat it operatively initially, with, again, a, a, a small percentage of delayed reconstruction. The method of treatment in this group would be uh, almost 80 percent would, would go through the tibia, and a majority would uh, go through the femur, uh, femoral growth plate. And as far as graft choice is concerned, 70 percent would use a soft tissue hamstring graft, um, 20 percent would use a bone patella bone, and at that time, uh, 1 percent would use allograft. Uh, of that group, 11 percent of the people who responded had had growth disturbances, and of those growth disturbances, uh, 80 percent were on the femoral side, 20 percent on the tibial side. So out of this survey, the recommendations were that uh, a soft tissue graft is optimum, uh, make a smaller graft tunnel as possible, uh, avoid your hardware fixation uh, through the growth plate itself, and when you're going, if you're going over the top, to try to avoid uh, uh, affecting the uh, physis, the growth plate in that area. Uh, finally, when you are dealing with the older adolescent or uh, with an ACL rupture, when the patient is at or near full bony maturity, treatment is similar to an adult. ACL reconstruction is usually recommended to prevent recurrent instability and meniscal damage. Autograft bone patella bone or hamstrings are usually the graft of choice. And allografts, which are being used more and more, have a higher failure rate in this aged patient than in older patients. A recent study showed that the failure rate in the young patient with allograft approaches 25%, while the failure rate in uh, older patients, say a 40-year-old, is maybe 3 to 5%. So that is a significant, uh, significant difference. Thank you.